Arthur John Priest should have died at least four times, but he was unsinkable. This week on the Internet Says It's True. Hey! hey there, welcome to the Internet Says It's True, where every week we learn something that sounds made up but is really true, part of the WCBE podcast experience. My name is Michael Kent, and this is episode 157. We're keeping it going as long as you keep listening. That's how it works. This week, we've got an episode about one man's amazing defiance in the face of multiple brushes with death at sea. This month, we're doing bonus episodes, which is part of our annual patron drive. You can hear those interspersed with the regular episodes, and those are excerpts from my web show, Joke Story Trick, where I invited interesting guests on to tell amazing stories. Last week, we heard from Congressman Mark Pocan comedy writer Jimmy Mack and magician Chipper Lowell and they all came on and told stories. It's part of a patron drive and a thank you for listening. You can join Patreon at patreon.com slash Michael Kent and when you do that you get access to all of the episodes of Joke Story Trick along with a bunch of other cool bonuses. Once again that's patreon.com slash Michael Kent Also, if you haven't already please head over to the Apple Podcasts app and leave this show a five star review with a few words about what you like about the show and that's Always hugely appreciated. And finally, there's merch for the show on the website. If you go to the internet says it's true.com and click merch, you can see mugs and t-shirts that you can buy. I can attest to the quality of both. They're awesome, super soft t-shirts and mugs that you can fit all four fingers in the handle. All good stuff. So for today, we're talking about a guy that was born back in 1887. Imagine loving the sea spending your whole life sailing, and then, once you retire, not being able to talk anyone into sailing with you. That was the fate of Arthur John Priest. Before we talk about Arthur John Priest, I want to talk about an unrelated cat. I know, that was a sharp turn. But this wasn't just any cat. This was a lucky cat during World War II. He was known as Sam, but others called him Oscar. During World War II, Sam the cat was on board the German battleship Bismarck. The Bismarck saw a famous and fierce naval battle in May of 1941 when she was sank by British ships in the Battle of the Denmark Strait and the pursuit that followed after. The Bismarck had over 2,100 German sailors on board and only 115 survived. But along with those 115 floating on the wreckage of the ship was Sam the Cat. Sam, along with other survivors, were picked up by the British destroyer HMS Cossack and named Oscar. Oscar for the letter O, which in the Naval International Code of Signals stood for Man Overboard. Only five months later, that ship too was sunk when the German U-boat's torpedo ripped into her bow, killing 159 sailors. The cat lived through this attack as well and was rescued. Then sometime between October and November, the cat was renamed Sam and often called Unsinkable Sam. One of the ships that was in the battle that sank the Bismarck was the aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal. Sam was put on board the Ark Royal as their sort of ship mascot, but that November it encountered U-81, another German U-boat, and was hit with a torpedo. This time most of the crew was saved as the carrier slowly rolled over before sinking. Along with those saved once again was Sam the Cat. So one cat survived three sinking ships in just six months. And believe it or not, our story about Arthur John Priest is more amazing than that. He survived four sinking ships and perhaps as many as six disasters at sea. We'll tell you his story after a quick break. We're living through the most dynamic time in human history and what we do as leaders matter. We are the ones that create the leverage to shift directions of our companies, our nonprofits, and our communities. As a leader or an emerging leader, please join me for a dynamic conversation with top thought leaders, academics, and executives to learn more about how to elevate your leadership. I'm Maureen Metcalf. Join us at the WCBE podcast experience at wcbe.o. If you love listening to this podcast every week and you want to show your support, that would mean a great deal to me. You can do that by becoming a Patreon member. We've got members at all levels, whether you want to pledge $1 a month or $10 a month. Just think about the value that you receive from this show. And if you like the histories and the stories that you learn about or the jokes that you hear, and if you think that they're worth it, consider signing up. 
For that, you get every episode ad-free and a week early, access to bonuses like the unedited videos of the guest appearances, and 20% off all merchandise. You can sign up today at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. That's patreon.com slash Michael Kent. There was a time that humans used 100% organic products as healing balms and moisturizers for their skin. Well, I've partnered with an awesome company that wants to get back to those times. Fatco sells organic and responsibly made tallow-based skincare products. For centuries, humans used tallow in skin moisturizers and healing bombs, but unfortunately, the topical application of these fats seemed to stop around the same time that animal fats stopped being considered part of a healthy diet. A lot of modern skincare products do more harm than good by stripping your skin of its natural oils. Let's change that. You can try them out now at fatco.com and get 15% off your order by using my promo code INTERNET. Go to the internet says it's true.com slash deals for the link. The Titanic had 29 boilers. It took a lot of men to keep those boilers steaming as the giant ship left Southampton on April 10th, 1912. 150 men to be exact. They were known as stokers, but other common slang terms for them at the time were the black gang or firemen. It was hard work. The conditions in the bowels of the ship were hot, dirty, and the hours were long. The men would often strip down and remove their shirts while working just to stay cool. Arthur John Priest, known to his friends as Jack, had worked as a stoker his whole life. On the Titanic, the black gang shoveled as much as 600 tons of coal a day to keep the ship moving. We know most of the rest of the story. Four days later, while off the coast of Nova Scotia, the ship struck an iceberg in the middle of the night. And of the 2,224 people on board, only 705 were rescued. Of those 705, 44 of them were stokers. That means more than 100 of the stokers working the ship's boilers perished in the accident. Miraculously, Arthur John Priest was one of the 44 members of the Black Gang to make it out alive. He suffered some frostbite and an injured leg from swimming in the cold Atlantic water, but made his way to an already full lifeboat who took him aboard. It was miraculous that anyone survived the sinking of the ship with the conditions and the speed that the Titanic sank. But for a boiler room stoker, a fireman, the journey in the complete pitch black bowels of the ship was a difficult one. He had to find his way from below deck through winding hallways and staircases, through gates and doors before he finally made it out to a freezing ocean. And there's also the miraculous fact that this wasn't his first disaster at sea. The Titanic's sister ship, the Olympic, almost suffered a similar fate just six months before the Titanic's maiden voyage. The Olympic was almost identical to the Titanic and had a complement of about the same amount of stokers working the boilers of the ship. Arthur John Priest being one of them. On November 20th, 1911, the Olympic was sailing near the Isle of Wight, having just left Southampton when she turned right into a nearby cruiser, the HMS Hawk. The Hawk was a military ship designed to withstand ramming enemy ships. She tore two holes in the Olympic, above and below the water, flooding two of her watertight compartments and damaging a propeller. Though both ships were badly damaged, both survived and were able to make it back to Southampton, both with gaping holes in their holes. Jack Priest, along with everyone else on board, had escaped death. So by the time he made it to shore in Halifax, Nova Scotia, after surviving a freezing cold ocean and the sinking of the Titanic, 24-year-old Priest was now considering himself lucky for surviving, but perhaps unlucky for being in both of these disasters at sea, all for a salary of only around six pounds a month. In my opinion, he was lucky. Oh, and also the crash of the Olympic wasn't his first time being in a disaster at sea. Several years earlier before that, at the age of 20, Priest had been hired as a stoker on the RMS Asturias. It was the maiden voyage for the Royal Mail ship, and it suffered a disastrous collision with another ship. While it was badly damaged, the ship returned safely and reported no serious injuries. After recovering from his Titanic injuries, Priest enjoyed a few years of work as a fireman on ships before war broke out in Europe. The RMS Alcantara was a merchant cruiser requisitioned by the Royal British Navy and this became the HMS Alcantara, 
just in time for the First World War. Arthur John Priest found himself hired as a fireman on board and thus joined the war effort along with many of his fellow countrymen. In February of 1916, she was fired upon by a Norwegian merchant ship. But Michael, you might be saying, Norway was a neutral country during the war. Why did they fire on a British ship? Well, it turns out they didn't. It turns out it was a German Navy merchant raider, a ship called Graf, who had just been disguised as a Norwegian civilian ship. The two ships exchanged fire in a horrible battle at sea that left the Alcantara so badly damaged, several of her lifeboats were ruined, and as she listed, she capsized and sank. The Graf sank as well, and many sailors on both sides were killed. For Priest, 70 of his shipmates were lost. He somehow survived with no injuries, except for a few wounds from shrapnel. He wasn't giving up his job as a stoker, however. His next assignment would be on the Britannic, his third White Star Line ship after the Olympic and the Titanic. It was only eight months after the sinking of the Alcantara, and he found himself on the HMHS Britannic, which was acting as a hospital ship bringing injured British soldiers home to Britain from the Mediterranean Sea. As it was sailing southeast of Greece, the ship struck a mine and started sinking. Now, she sank slowly enough for most of the crew to escape to lifeboats, although two of these lifeboats were sucked into the propellers, killing 30 men. Once again, Priest came out alive. The next April, this was 1917, Arthur was working as a stoker on another hospital ship, the SS Donegal. It was engaged by a German U-boat, but managed to outrun the enemy submarine. But then it encountered more U-boats and was torpedoed by one of them, U-27, while in the English Channel. The ship was lost with 12 dead and more than 20 injured. Priest escaped unharmed. The Donegal still rests at the bottom of the English Channel in about 150 feet of water. After this, Arthur John Priest decided his sailing days were over. Besides, the story had gotten out about his horrible luck with ships and no one wanted to put him in service on their crafts. In 1917, he was awarded the Mercantile Marine Ribbon for his service in the war and retired with his wife Annie in Southampton. It was there that he lived out the rest of his days and died from pneumonia in 1937 at the age of 49. Newspapers around the world gave a nickname to Arthur John Priest, who survived as many as six accidents at sea and four sinking ships. He became known forever as the Unsinkable Stoker. The Internet says it's true. It's time for the part of the podcast where I call a friend, and today I'm calling my friend magician Eric Tate. Eric has been on this podcast a few times before, so if you're a regular listener, you will recognize his voice. He's an international award-winning magician, comedian, and podcaster. Eric Tate, it is so good to see you, man. It's been a while. Hi, Mr. Kent. How are you? I'm good. How have you been? I'm spectacular, but I'll get better. What uh, what have you been up to lately? Oh, you know, uh, winning a prize at FISM, traveling the world, teaching magic to strangers, and trying to uh, conquer my addiction to spending unnecessary money on upgrades to my computer. Your computer, primarily, are you using it for streaming these days, or what? what's your gaming? What's your primary purpose? Oh, I mean, I haven't streamed in months. Really? I've been on the road. Yeah. Um, uh, no, uh, mostly for uh, video editing, for mm-hmm. work, for and work. Uh, and gaming, um, and then uh, my own podcast stuff. Uh, but also, I just like the more pretty lights because the, <laughs> the the more lights there are in a system, the be- the better. If you can see Eric's setup, I think you call it Descatron or something along these lines. It, it's now Descatron 3.0. Descatron 3.0 is full, filled with like RGB lights, and uh, basically, if it is on his desk, it somehow lights up or flashes, and uh, it's it's quite a sight, I have to say. And for There's those of a you, custom LCD screen that I installed in the side that I have like a moving wallpaper on now. And oh my it god! Lo- it loops and shows my FISM win uh, <laughs> in, the, in the screen. It's that it's, is so it's incredulous. A, it, it's a monument to my own hubris. <laughs> That's amazing. It used to just be clear. Didn't you have your actual FISM trophy inside the the box at one point? Uh, oh, oh, it's still in there. It's <laughs> okay. the, the FISM trophy is in there next to a looping video of the. <laughs> you know what that's like? That's like uh, 
the, the Walgreens has those fridges now that have like, you know, you go in and the Mountain Dew is in there, but yeah. on front is an LCD screen of a picture of Mountain Dew. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to like look at the picture, open it up and then see what you're looking at a picture of. That is exactly uh, what it is like. How, <laughs> what have you been up to? Same just traveling, doing shows. Uh, yep. College stuff is starting up. So, um, you know, it's nice. not back to where it was pre pandemic, but it's, it's decent. It's OK. Uh, I did a ship and then I've been doing some college dates. I've got next week, I've got a, a block of college dates that are all within like a few hundred miles of each other. So it, it's a routed tour for once in my life, which is fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. One flight to Boston, four shows, and then one flight back home. So that'll be nice, nice. next week. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm about to leave for, I'm leaving on Friday morning for Texas. I'm, uh, I'm speaking and performing at the TAOM convention. TAOM. Yeah. My buddy CJ will be there. Uh, so oh, cool. TAOM is what's that stand for? The, the amazing Texas Association of Magicians. The amazing uh, ostentatious magicians. Yes, Texas. Yeah, Association no, it's, it's of like magicians. one of the better conventions. I've never somehow I've never been to it, but the okay. lineup is stacked. It's like uh, uh, myself, uh, Doc Eason. Uh, sorry about my dogs in the background. They I can are barely wrestling. hear them. <laughs> you have two dogs now. I yeah. Uh, we picked up Bellatrix uh, last year okay you're no two years ago Great. she's two and he's three i think cool or maybe i don't know yeah she's a little she's tiny and black and the same uh size and like semi like mutt breed status to see sure. although they look close enough together that people think they're related but they're not they're rescued from very different areas and cool. he's a year older than her uh but i do want to build the microwave illusion to do with them oh so you're going to put a dog in a microwave for the audience's yeah, so amusement? Do you remember the really racist uh, illusion <laughs> yes. from the 90s where yes. a white guy would get into a giant microwave yes. and then it would like blink and flash and smoke and then a black guy would come out? Yes. Yes. Unfortunately, I, I want to do that. But with my dogs, <laughs> that's, that's a much less racist for yeah. dog. It's still racist to dogs, but they can't speak. So they're not going to cancel you. Yeah. It's okay. It's, it's fine. <laughs> Within I, the dog um, community, it's still incredibly racist. Yes. Oh, extremely. Um, but uh, but I think that everyone will be OK with it because every everyone involved is very cute and it's not yeah. a, it's very clearly not a real microwave. <laughs> that's that's great. I, I there was a comedian. I can't remember who it was that had a song about cats in a microwave. I'm going to have to I'll find that and send it to you uh, back to Texas real quick. I was there last week for an outdoor show in San Antonio. It was like 100 degrees. That sounds uh, awful. It was really tough, but. Uh, there, there was a good audience and that helped me sort of forget about the heat is I think it's the only time I've ever done a show in, in shorts and flip flops. I actually just did the show because I was like, I'm not going to try to pretend that this is a real thing like this is a normal yeah. situation. So anywho, well, let's get into this uh, this week. Uh, this is a the first question. We always play for a joke. So if you get it wrong, you gotta tell me a joke. If you get it right, I'll tell you one. Uh, I did look one up for last week's episode that I didn't use, so that I'm gonna I'm gonna use that one. Um, Arthur John Priest is the name of the person we're talking about this week. Okay. He was a survivor of the Titanic. Okay. And why was his story so notable? Obviously, notable that someone survived the Titanic, but there's another reason that his story was notable. Was it a he designed the ship? B he survived four shipwrecks in his lifetime, or C he went on to write the best-selling novel, The Sun Also Rises. Um, I believe that all of these are true, but not necessarily about the same person. <laughs> um, and so, I, because I think that you have thrown me for a loop here. I think that what you have done is said, I'm going to screw with Eric's brain, so and I'm going to take three facts that are true, uh, about survivors I, of the Titanic, but apply. I, I will to tell one. you. I will give you a hint. Uh, two of these, I did make up off the top of my head. So if they are true of someone who was on the Titanic, it's purely a happenstance coincidence. Did he? Um, is this the guy who survived four other shipwrecks? Is that where you're going to go with? That's what I'm going to go with. You are correct. He survived four shipwrecks in his lifetime. Okay. Uh, yeah, this guy uh, was on. He actually. He was he four shipwrecks, but then like two other disasters at sea on top of the four. So like he should have died yes. at least six times. Uh, yes. He was on the the Olympic before the Titanic, which was the sister ship. And he was on the Britannic, which was another sister ship of the. And those all had incidences. The The Britannic sank. sank. It was it was used during World War One as a hospital ship. So was mm -hmm. 
one of the other ships he was on that sank. Just really bad luck or good luck because he lived um, and, and never died from any of these things. He survived four of them. Uh, but the Titanic was one where wait, I mean, this dude was a stoker. I mean, he was down in the bowels of the ship. So, what, yeah, I think that's the that's why it sticks in my brain, because yeah. I've definitely heard this trivia piece before, um, because it usually revolves around how like insane it is that he survived at all let alone multiple times because like yeah. it's not like getting out of the bowels of a sinking ship is easy especially <laughs> like back when it was like coal powered coal powered and, and by this point you know the lights were gone there were no yeah. lights when he was when he was trying to find his way i think the titanic of all the stories that i read about this the titanic was the most miraculous because mm -hmm. that was the one where the most people died uh he it was the biggest ship with the largest you know incident rate or, or uh instance of of um, people dying and it sank, I think faster than any of these other ones. So yes. it was, it was pretty crazy. Um, and there were a couple other people, I didn't really touch on this in the episode, uh, but there were a couple other people that were on the Olympic that also went on to be in the Titanic from the crew. There was a steward, yes. or I think it was a stewardess, um, that was also there. So, um, all right, man, you're, you're off to a good start. Here's a, a joke for you. Um, this is uh coincidentally a joke about a guy named Eric. No relation. Eric, like I said, this was for last week's show. Eric is stranded on an island. He starts hopelessly wandering around and he hides behind the bushes when he comes up uh, on a local tribe of cannibals and their cannibal king sitting on a golden throne. I'm screwed, Eric whispers to himself. Then out of nowhere appears a wise old man. He says, no, you are not, and I'll prove it. He says that to Eric, then he picks up a small rock from the ground. He said, you must take this magic rock and throw it at the cannibal king. Eric desperately throws the stone and he hits the cannibal king right in the forehead. He looks back at the old man and he says, now what? The wise old man smiles and says, ah, see, now you're screwed. <laughs> Stupid joke. Oh, yeah. Slow clap is kind of where that is. Um, <laughs> slow clap. Off mic, slow clap. Your dogs were louder than that clap, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> They they are now peaceful. Uh, they have tuckered themselves out. They're over in their own area. I'm I'm That's still trying good. to get cameras set up to to my, be on on their beds now. My youngest dog, who is a year and a half old, uh, seven pounds. She just got weighed at the vet today. She was in for an appointment because uh, she has a hernia. I didn't know oh, dogs no. got hernias, but uh, it's a result. She had a lot of surgeries in her first year of life, so yeah. uh, it's a result of that. And uh, yeah, so but she's good. Everything's good. I have three, hear three dogs and uh, a bunch of horses. So, yeah, uh, you're one for one. Question two, we're going to play for your favorite album. So uh, you don't have to give me your favorite album, but you can tell me what it is. Okay. Uh, third class passengers aboard the Titanic didn't have the lavish accommodations as the higher class passengers. How many bathtubs were there for the 700 third class passengers? A, two bathtubs. B, 10 or C, none? I believe it was C, none. The answer is A, two. There were two bathtubs two. for oh. 700 people. There's one men's and one women's. And that's, you know what? You're probably right. And it was probably a thing yeah. where it was like at the end of the hall or something along those lines. Oh, wait um, a minute. Which class did you say? This was third class. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I feel like I've heard another fact about like the people who worked on the Titanic didn't have any bathtubs or something. Oh, I'm like sure that. they probably didn't. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, there's definitely something. There's definitely some fact about like a part of the Titanic didn't have like some sort of like thing that we would just like consider normal now because uh, oh, probably we we believe in medicine and, and stuff. <laughs> but yeah, two bathtubs is insane. Yeah, both with it being the 1910s and with it being you know like early in the days of luxury steamships. So. Yes. Uh okay so do you have like a favorite album favorite album of yours Um I it changes from time to time but I think like right now it's probably Kesha's Warrior Ooh Oh that's a I would not have uh gone for for that Now generally my favorite albums tend to be like older is there an yeah. is there a an evergreen favorite album or is that the one for you Um I mean that album is pretty old yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I don't want to think about that, but yeah, it's probably at least 10 years old, right? Yeah, so I saw, I actually went to the tour 
that Ke- the the warrior tour that that Kesha did for that, and I think the music on it is generally like pretty solid. Mm. Um, uh, I I do happen to be a fairly large Kesha fan, but I also like there's other albums that I'm a big fan of. Like again, this is like it's not an older album, but I do listen to it a lot. Is uh, there's a Lindsey Sterling album that mm. I I'm a big fan of. Okay, um, that I can just sort of like look here and be like, which one is it? Um. Oh, it's uh, "Shatter Me" by uh, Lindsey Sterling. That's her second album, which okay. is it's really good. There's just like a bunch of like really good stuff on there. Awesome. Uh, however, I recently like I had to drive back and forth from Erie. I've been going back and forth from Erie a lot. Mm-hmm. I'm in that. <laughs> Some somebody at the door. Uh, oh, oh, do you need to go? No, there's oh, okay. just somebody near my front door. Oh, so um, the dogs are telling you. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Uh, so I was listening to some older albums on the way back and forth because I had recently listened to the Woodstock 99 mm-hmm. um, uh, <laughs> documentary yeah. because yeah. that thing was insanity. Yeah, it was. It was. That was so a really interesting So I started interesting listening to a bunch of new metal on the way on like when I was just <laughs> running around in Erie. And so there was a couple of like older ones that I was like, oh, yeah, these were bangers. Sure. Um, Dude, so, I remember uh, like in 99, you know, it was my third year of college. Yeah. And, and I remember like listening to Limp Biscuit before going out. To, that was like our pump up music before going out to the bars and uh, not seeing any problem with that. And then you watch you watch that documentary. I'm like, oh, this is all awful. It was yeah. all bad. It's so unnecessarily aggressive. And, and there's the people like, are. And, <laughs> like the, well, but like the also the music, like the music is unnecessarily aggressive. Everyone at Woodstock 99 was unnecessarily aggressive. But also if you listen to them sing. There's a lot of dudes back then who were front men for bands who had no business on vocals. <laughs> right. I'm sure. I'm sure. It, and that's maybe that says something that's a good thing about like maybe today is a little bit higher bar for for, mm-hmm. you know, for vocals. But I look at the I watched that that documentary and I'm looking at the guys. I'm like, these guys are such D bags. Yeah. But they were exactly how i was back then like wearing the exact same clothing that i wore oh, yeah. probably acting the same way frosted tips visor cargo khakis and it's just ridiculous um oh, i have no business trying to defend any of this or looking back <laughs> on that because i vividly remember being into limp biscuit insane clown posse yeah, yeah. lincoln park we didn't uh, have many choices in the late 90s no, no, you didn't. No, listening to ninety four point three extreme radio. Um. <laughs> oh man, yeah. My it seems like my my favorite albums uh, tend to lately be like all from the seventies, like late sixties, early seventies. But I'm gonna save them for um, another episode when someone gets that question wrong, and then I'll or don't get someone me, gets that right. Don't get me wrong. Get I recently went to see Styx in concert and it's Ooh. the second time I've seen Styx yeah. and those albums slap. Like there are so many great Styx songs. I'm going to have to get into realize. Styx. Yeah. I don't think I, the only thing I remember of Styx, like from my childhood was that my aunt would play Mr. Roboto mm-hmm. and would scare the living crap out of me. That song, the intro to that song is so yeah. scary for, at least for a little, maybe a little kid growing up in the eighties, it was scary. Um, but but like, I haven't gone back come and listened sail to away. Sticks. Yeah, Come, come sail, sail Away is, is a good. stick song. And like you can like you don't realize it until somebody puts it on. But sure. Any, everyone can sing every word to Come Sail Away. <laughs> Interesting. I'm going to have to test that out when we're done here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You well, know, no, no, I, I can't do it unless the song is on. Sure. Like if the song is playing, then it's just like I'm flawless. But if you were just like, ah, sing it for me, like acapella, no way I could do it. It's uh, but Come Sail Away is ingrained in the dna great, of the american human sure it'd be a great karaoke song now that i think about yes. it it's probably a little high um you know my wife went to a kesha concert when she was at the ohio state fair she went mm-hmm. and i just remember coming her coming home that night and there was glitter everywhere yes like on the floor of the kitchen and in her car it was just everywhere it was both glitter and like con- like glittery yes. confetti like mylar confetti it was everywhere so Kesha it seemed like is, it would have been a good time. Kesha is a phenomenal performer, an amazing vocalist. She's a great songwriter. Her production value is a war crime. Like uh, <laughs> she is she is an environmental disaster. Um <laughs> but uh 
is also the Kesha. The, con- the concert Kesha I went to was again Warrior Tour. She's kind of at the height of her powers. This is before the Dr. Luke stuff started coming out. Um, and she was one of the hottest female stars, like, like, I mean, just like there, she was everywhere. Yeah. And uh, that was the one of the few times I've ever been scared in a pit. Really? Um, because I was I was maybe 10 feet from the stage. There was only a thin line of people in front of me. Like I was, I was as close as you could get to the front of the stage as possible. And I've been to a lot of really hardcore concerts in my time. I've been in the pits for Green Day, Seven Dust, Godsmack, uh, Stained. I've been in multiple Guar pits. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Metallica, Tool. I've been I've been in some some uh, some pits. Uh, two different war, uh, warp tours. Uh, I was in you know many many pits there. And there's still like it doesn't matter how hardcore the music is or how insane the fans are. There's still like a little bit of a a code where like if somebody goes down, you pick them up, you dust them sure. off. If they're hurt, you either send them to security or eject them out the back of the pit. Um, but the but you they're it generally like it gets violent and rowdy and rambunctious, but you're still all trying to make sure that everyone's okay, right? Yeah. At Kesha, it was all like that close to the stage. I mean, I'm in my like late twenties when this this concert is. So, but everyone else is like. 12 to 17 year old girls who just want to be as close to their god queen as they can there were no rules i saw people go down and never come back it's probably a bunch of people who have never moshed or been in a pit before in their life yeah and that's so they don't have those you know standards it's not a mosh pit even it's i mean it's just like it's a it's just the general admission like it's the pit it's the crowd and and it's not and it's so like my best friend at the time was a 230 pound professional bouncer he was yeah. the guy who like at insane clown posse shows is grabbing you off the crowd and taking you off mm-hmm. and we looked at each other and i saw him like actually afraid <laughs> oh my god you know i've never really the only closest i've ever been to a pit was i guess like some flogging molly shows i would kind yeah. of be on the edge but i'm never going to be that guy in the middle crowd killing or like doing the like you know running around with my arms flailing like yeah. some of the people do oh yeah absolutely what do they call it All the right. uh they call it the the strut the the huntington beach strut or something like that when they like yeah. the people run around and just like basically just punching anyone that they can reach um yeah it's 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 a it's a it's a heck of a good time is all I'm saying. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's let's move on. Um, our next question is uh, for a sticker, as it always is. Uh, mm-hmm. Here is the question. When a major excavation was taking place, the mangled skeleton remains of an old wooden ship was discovered. Where and when was this? I'm sure it's happened a lot, but I've put three examples here. One of them, it actually happened. Okay. Uh, a, when they were digging the foundation to build Yankee Stadium. B, when they were digging up rubble from Ground Zero after 9-11. Or C, when they were completing the big dig in Boston? Uh, the big dig was to extend the um, Boston subway, right? Yeah, um, I believe it was also the, the tunnels that the cars drive in from the airport into the I th- city, I believe. I think it was the big dig because I think that that's the only one that like was involving water. Like they were like doing it. They were doing a tunnel thing because I don't think the Trade Center was above water and i don't think yankee stadium was uh, yankee stadium is like fairly inland i think um so they wouldn't have found a, a ship there i'm pretty sure it's the boston's a big dig the answer it's actually ground zero um this is strange so it had to have been real old because uh you know apparently that manhattan island that part of it would have been underwater at some point because there was okay. a, they found an old old ship down way underneath the world trade center when they were you know excavating uh, yeah. yeah i think yankee stadium stadium probably rear right is too far inland there in the bronx but um but yeah crazy story they they weren't able to identify the actual ship uh, you know they don't know what the ship was but they were able to look at the wood and tell that it was it, definitely Bush put it there <laughs> that's right yeah it was all part of the conspiracy just to throw people off just to throw people off a little bit more. So. Jet fuel can't melt steel beams. It also can't melt ancient wooden <laughs> ancient ships. Ancient century ships. 
Uh, no, but it can find them, apparently. All right, let's keep moving on. Question four. For this question, we're going to play for like some sort of embarrassing story. So if you've got to, okay. you know, if you get it wrong, tell us something embarrassing or, or funny that's happened to you. If you get it right, I'll share one that has happened to me. Here's the question. Both the Titanic and the Olympic from White Star Line left from Southampton in England. What other famous ship originally left from Southampton? Was it A, the Mayflower? B, the whale ship Essex, or C, Charles Darwin's journey on the Beagle? Um, it's either the Mayflower or the Beagle. Uh, what, what was the port of origin? Uh, Southampton. Where, where is Southampton? Uh, Southampton is south central. So, like pretty much straight down from london okay maybe a I little it, bit to the west I, but but i think it was the beagle the answer the mayflower so this mayflower. one okay this one is kind of a i'm only going to take away half a point for this one because uh mayflower came to america from plymouth but it left from southampton in 1612 and started taking on water and had to return to England. So when it returned to England, it re only returned to Plymouth, which is further west. So than, okay. than Southampton. So um, and the Beagle was um, the Beagle left from I may have been Plymouth. I can't remember where the Beagle left from, but I checked all of these to make sure they didn't leave from Southampton except for except for the Mayflower. Um, so, yeah, interesting um, history from Southampton. And I think it was just probably the largest close port to London at the time yeah um okay so, yeah there we go um do you have an embarrassing or fun story um one time i fell off of a japanese robot toilet wait start what hum the, okay so uh <laughs> i was visiting with uh some people who had a, one of those japanese robot toilets in their house um the kind that has like the yeah. automated bidet yeah yeah here in america drawings. Uh, yes, it was oh. it was installed here. It was a very expensive toilet. Yeah. Um, but I was it was the the house I was visiting was a house full of ladies. Uh huh. And so you these, uh, this particular toilet had a uh, <clears throat> a masculine and a feminine setting. <laughs> yeah. But it did not have a detection, so it was just like you had to know to set it oh, like one boy. way or the other with the controls. Oh boy. And so I didn't know that. And so it uh, went into its like it could sense when you had started and finished. And then it went into its cleaning cycle and it cleaned me as though I was a lady. Oh, boy. Uh, which surprised me. And I fell off. <laughs> wow. So yes. that's amazing in, in a few different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact that it auto senses when you need to be cleaned is really impressive. It is um, also entirely possible that I like was like, what is this button? And then it's just like, but it, no, I, I, it, I remember going to uh, the first time I went, I had experienced one of those really high tech toilets was in a McDonald's in uh, Naha in, in um, Okinawa. Yeah. And it was just like, I was like, I wasn't expecting that in a McDonald's, I guess, of all places. But there mm -hmm. were probably at least 12 buttons and there yeah. was a fan and a heater and uh a dryer you know all these different like fan and a dryer will be the same thing but yeah i remember the front wash and the back wash or whatever yeah. and uh yeah that is i uh, have a bidet and i swear yeah. by it like oh, the I worst part of going on the road these days is because same. i don't have my bidet anymore same and sometimes i find myself reaching down to turn mm -hmm. the knob when there's no knob yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it's it's you know this this podcast is not sponsored by any bidet companies but i'm telling you if you have not done it uh, do it. You can get yeah. one on Amazon for like 30 or 40 bucks. Super easy to install. And you don't even need the kind with hot water. T trust mm -hmm. me. You just get the regular kind. You don't need to run hot. You just use the line that's already run into your toilet. And this is like a go between and you turn one knob and it will change your day. Guaranteed. It's, it's amazing. I had one sent to me for my birthday, but uh, there was what? no return card and so i spent or there was no like who it was from so i spent literally weeks trying to figure out who <laughs> sent me this bidet it turned out it was my bartender chris merrick okay um, i i know chris and yeah. um uh, my my first question was going to be who is going to send you a bidet and my second question is like is there some sort of like questioning of yourself when you get a bidet in the mail you're like is this person trying to tell me that my ass stinks 
I get a lot of weird stuff sent to me. Um, <laughs> and so like, and like a, a do it yourself bidet install is like not out of character for something. Cause I'm like, I have, I install all kinds of weird gadgets in my house. I've yeah. spent far too much money on lighting um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and PowerPoints and USB things. And, you need and an RGB bidet is what you need. I, I actually have an RGB module in my toilet. Oh my God. Of course you do. Yes. That's amazing. I do have an RGB <laughs> module in my toilet. And uh, if you open, if if it's dark and it's on and yeah. you open the door just right and the lid is closed it and it's on the red, because uh, it color cycles. I have it as doing <laughs> rainbow puke. Yeah. And um, uh, it, when you open it and it's red, it looks like a portal from hell. It's uh, <laughs> it's pretty scary. But uh, also a gift from Chris. Chris but, is like every good. year for my birthday, Chris toilet gives me based. a different to, like high-tech toilet accessory so i'm excited to see what i'm getting next year i need to get better friends with chris that's that's what i'm learning from this conversation recommend yes <laughs> well eric you're one for four so far and you can redeem it all with this next question this is for all mm-hmm. the marbles if you get it right you are welcome back on the show anytime if you get it wrong you're banned for life okay. uh you do the penguin magic podcast which is a podcast yes. Primarily for magicians to listen to where you're interviewing different magicians. And um, one of the things that you do as a recurring segment is Desert Island Magic Books, which I've done. I refuse to answer this question on principle. I'm not. It's a different question than you think. Okay. If you were on a deserted island, what would be your one Desert Island non-magic book? Uh, Oh, that's simple. It's uh, uh, Last Chance to See by Douglas Adams. Last Chance to See by Douglas. Can you tell me a little bit about this? Being, I'm not familiar at all. Uh, so Douglas Adams is primarily known for writing Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy mm-hmm. and then doing a number of articles for like Wired and like Sunday afternoon essays in um, The Independent. Okay. And uh, one of the few like nonfiction books he wrote uh, was Last Chance to See. So he had done a... Um, it's like a really like not a lot of people know about this book, but it's arguably one of his best books. Interesting. Um, so he went he he got hired by this magazine to go to Madagascar and write an article about the eye eye, which is a type of endangered lemur. It's a night lemur. And uh, they've got these skeletally long fingers that they use to like tap and find termites and ants inside of um, uh, trees. And then they'll stick the finger into like holes in the trees to like get bugs out and eat them. And they've got these giant, beautiful eyes in there. Uh, they're really spooky looking, um, but they're also critically endangered because uh, various people have thought that they like cause diseases or are bad omens. And so they've been hunted near to extinction. And he went with a uh, a, a naturalist named Mark Cowardine, um, who sort of uh, was the telling who was doing the science and doing a study on the eyes and trying to like figure out ways to save them. And it it's a it also represented like a pivotal moment in Douglas Adams' life because he'd never really understood um, how deeply intertwined. Like he was a big science guy, but he didn't really understand how many endangered animals there were and how much of an effect humans had on this. And so him and Mark Cowardine got along really well, and they talked about the the um, the Baiji River dolphins and the kakapo and uh the komodo dragons and uh the southern and northern white rhinos and all of these different um uh, endangered animals and so they ended up so the, they published the he published the article on the ii and then he ended up doing a follow-up thing where him and mark Cowardine would go and like find these endangered animals like critically endangered i mean like at the time that he was looking for the baiji river dolphin which i believe has been declared extinct there was only thought to be seven of them in the wild Wow. Uh, you know, when he was going to look for the Kakapo, um, there was maybe four. Now there's a hundred or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so it is this really wonderful book that, ta- that takes in and tells you all about these amazing animals, but also talks about humanity and uh, the different experiences that he had. Like when they went to go. So the pro- one of the problems with the Baiji River Dolphin and that a lot of wildlife has in China is that when it's in the Yangtze, Yangtze River is that um, for centuries, people only went up and down the river on uh, junk uh, ships, uh, the the Chinese junk ships, which are like sort of the big, like they've got lots of sails, mm-hmm. um, you know, but it was air powered. But along comes the. Uh, the. The propeller, <clears throat> the propeller and yeah. the, the internal combustion engine. And sure. so. Uh, that causes lots of sound 
and sound oh. travels great distances because water is is such a good conductor of sound and so it suddenly render and so imagine that you live in this world and then suddenly your entire because your entire their entire world is based on sound because their vision isn't great and the water is very silty uh and so imagine that you go from being able to see to just suddenly being blinded um and suddenly there's propellers going through your everyday life yeah and so this was the major problem which caused which and you know and they were used for sort of meat uh, as well and so one of the things that they had to do was douglas adams was very curious as to how what it would be like to be in this sort of soundscape of the Yangtze river but they hadn't brought a hydrophone but the bbc has a um uh a method of of creating a hydrophone in circumstances where you didn't bring one which is you put a condom mm -hmm. on a uh, microphone and then you can control it in the water sure um but because of china's one child policy at the time because this book was written in like the early to mid 80s um and the china's one policy at the time uh the pill was the prevailing um uh, type of birth control in china and so there's a very funny section of the book of four englishmen attempting trying, trying to, to find, find a condom, a condom in china, in china. <laughs> uh wow and and to not to have sex but in order to record the sounds of the river that the dolphins would hear wow. but it's all stuff like that yeah. um it, it's all like can, can you tell me one more not one more time the name of the book it's called last chance to see last chance to um, see all and right. it's it's an amazing book. It's really good. And then if you there's also a BBC documentary where they did a follow up to Last Chance to See where Mark Cowardin went around, but uh, Douglas Adams had passed away. And so they uh, they had Stephen Fry, who was a very close mm -hmm. friend of Douglas Adams, fill in uh, for what Douglas Adams would have done. But the whole Last Chance to See stuff is is really it's so good because it was also a radio program that he did, yeah, um, and a book and a ser and and it's just so it's so good. I, I can read it over and over and over again. This is the type of stuff that I bring you on the podcast for. I love your your zoological knowledge and your um your level of interest in that type of thing and I need to get you on for an episode that can speak to that because mm -hmm. I always love talking to you about that that type of thing and that is by the way a right answer. So you are welcome back on the podcast anytime. Um I want everyone to go and check out Eric Tate online. Where can they find your stuff? uh i think the big thing these days is like instagram also the penguin magic podcast just mm -hmm. go to podcast.penguinmagic.com it's probably the best way to find out like where i'm gonna be uh so because i usually do like a wrap up at the end of the episode and anytime myself or nick lacapo or really anyone in the p3 team is going to be like touring or, mm -hmm. or uh having a live show somewhere we try and try and spread the word that way uh but you can usually find out kind of where i am through my instagram um so I think yeah. that's probably the best things to do, yeah. which and is my Instagram is at Eric Tate, at E-R-I-K-T-A-I-T. E-R-I-K-T-A-I-T. And if you're a magician who's listening, make sure you go check them out at T-A-O-M. That's coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming on the show again, Eric. Thank you. That is all for this week. Thank you so much to Eric Tate for being my guest. Here's the voice of a lovely English mermaid. Thank you for listening to The Internet Says It's True. To listen to episodes ad-free and a week early, support us on Patreon. You can do that at patreon.com forward slash Michael Kent. If you learned something just now that you didn't already know, go to the Apple Podcast app and leave us a review with five stars and a few words. That helps us a ton because that's how the algorithm works. I don't know what an algorithm is, but just do it. See you next week for a brand new episode of The Internet Says It's True! The Internet Says It's True would like to thank the Patreon subscribers whose monthly contributions help to make this show possible. Sean Brown, Joshua Endress, Dallas Ray, Bryce Swanson, Eugene Anderson, Jim and Joanne Martin, Mitch and Andrew Joseph Kemplin, and the show's official emperor, Kick Track. The show is written and produced by me, Michael Kent. The theme song is by Finite Music Forge, and all audio clips in this episode are used for education and commentary and used under Fair Use Title 17 USC Section 107. You can listen to past episodes by searching for The Internet Says It's True wherever you get your podcasts, and you can see bonus content at patreon.com slash Kent.